Would you steal a bike if there was no chance you'd get caught? The choice is yours. Why do people commit crimes? This is the University of the Netherlands. I want to start my lecture by putting you in a simple situation. Suppose you are driving to an interview for your dream job. You can choose to park illegally and be on time, or drive much further away and park legally, and perhaps arrive late. To decide, you would probably think about how likely it is that you get caught and get a ticket, and how expensive this fine would be, 50, 250 euros. You might also think about how good for your job chances being on time could be. Given all this, which parking spot would you choose? This is not just a random example. This is the story of how, 50 years ago, Nobel Prize economist Gary Becker, after facing such a parking dilemma, came to develop the idea of crime decision making as a rational choice. A choice we make rationally, like most other decisions in our life. This was the start of the economics of crime, my field of research. In this lecture, I'll discuss this idea of rational decisions, and if it can explain why people commit crimes. In economics, we think a human takes most decisions rationally after making a cost-benefit analysis of this decision. For example, you are trying to decide how many hours to work in your job. If you choose more hours, you will have more money to spend on your home, clothes, and eating out. That is the benefit of the decision. But working more hours means you have less time for all the non-work activities that you enjoy. This is the cost of the decision. In economics, you can solve equations to calculate these costs and benefits. We assume you do this almost instantaneously for any decisions you make. It's not a new concept. It relates to the utilitarian ideas of Jeremy Bentham, an 18th century philosopher who argued that every human action, even crime, should be evaluated in terms of how much pleasure or benefit or pain it causes. Well, in Becker's original story, he decided to park illegally as the benefits outweigh the cost of doing so. This made him think of a model where crime could be considered as most other decision-making processes in economics. He started from the basic idea that most people consider the chance of getting caught and the harshness of punishment against the potential gains from a criminal action. He developed this into a complex equation. Don't worry, I'm not going to bother you with the mathematics. But I think it's worth taking you through the very simplified version of the model. Whether or not you commit crime is influenced by four factors or incentives. What you can earn by engaging in legal activities, for example, salary from a job. What you can earn from illegal activities, the money from stealing. How likely it is that the police will catch you and the severity of the punishment. However, it's not as simple as saying that for everyone, the crime decision is equal to X times the profit for illegal activity minus Y times the probability of being caught. But all four elements play an important role when deciding. What is crucial is that if only one of the factor changes, the decision to commit a crime can change as well. For example, in the last decades, there have been a lot of variation in the number of muggings in the streets. Before the only early 2000s, if you robbed someone, you might be lucky to get something like 40 euros from your crime. Soon, you could target almost anyone and be guaranteed 10 times that. Why? Did people start carrying much more cash? No. But expensive smartphones became very common and easy to resell. Stealing from people on the streets became much more lucrative and robberies increased a lot. In the economics of crime, we like to study each factor separately. Let's zoom in on the profit from legal activities. 
This represents the opportunities you have in life to get a good job, earn enough money, and have a nice home. This often depends on education level. And indeed, when you look at people who are arrested, they have on average lower levels of education. But does this automatically mean it's less education that leads to more crime? It's not so simple. There could be other factors at play. Maybe you have a certain trait that reduces the probability of you getting involved in crime and at the same time increases your chance of doing well in school. Patients, for example, could explain both more education and less crime, even if the two are not linked at all. So, we need to think and find a way to measure the real impact of education. A solution would be to find cases where everyone suddenly has to stay longer in school, even if they're not patient at all. That is exactly what happens when policies to increase the age of compulsory schooling are introduced. These are perfect situations to study if education, regardless of personality traits, prevents crime. And yes, it does, and by a lot. With the education example, we saw that it is important to think about the interpretation of a simple correlation. But at least the basic relationship of education and crime wasn't that unexpected. However, things can get a little strange if you're not careful. Let's take a closer look at one of the other factors in our crime model, the probability of being caught. The main thing studied on that front is the impact of the number of police. When you look at the relation between police and number of crime, we at first get a very surprising result. In areas where there are more police, there is also more crime. Should we conclude that having more police increases crime? Doesn't make sense, right? This is in economics what we call the problem of reverse causality. Think of the age-old question of who came first the chicken or the egg. Here, it's not that hard to conclude that there are usually more police somewhere because there was a lot of crime in the first place. How can we get a real causal effect then? Again, we need to think to find events that change the number of police in the area. For example, right before local elections in the US, more money is spent on the police. Not because there is more crime to start with, but to win votes. This enables us to show that police presence does lower crime rates. Studying the separate elements of our crime decision model is interesting, especially to know which policies to reduce crime can work best. But in reality, it's probably never just one element that drives the individual decision. It's about interactions between these elements. For example, there is a simple relationship between legal earnings and punishment severity. In our opening story, we talked about a parking decision influenced by the cost of receiving a ticket. A problem here is that if your income is very high and the parking ticket is 50 euros, that, not, that might not feel like very much. You will take the risk. In many countries, the size of the fine received is linked to your income. So, instead of 50 euros, a rich individual will receive a fine of 250 euros. Would you still take the risk? In the end, most people react as we predict in economics. If the relative pain from punishment is higher, they will commit less crime. So far, we've seen the main four factors of our crime decision model, and we know they influence each other. But there is a fifth and very important element. Think of this final element as impacting all other factors. It's linked to individual perception. What sounds like a severe punishment to you might be perceived very differently by someone else. That brings another layer of complexity to our model and explains why it can't be solved like a simple math equation. Our perception can depend on individual traits such as your personality or even just your age. When you are younger, you often do not fully foresee the long-term consequences 
that your actions can have. You can be short-sighted or myopic and not put much weight on the future cost that committing a crime has. This can explain why age and crime follow a very regular pattern, increasing during the teenage years before falling in one's 20s. The age crime curve this creates was something that Belgian scientist Adolphe Ketelet had already pointed to in the mid-19th century. That's also why the severity of punishment is slightly adapted for age. You'd say, this person is young, she's still a bit myopic, let's give her a chance to learn about the cost of their actions. Still, talking about crime participation as an individual decision might seem harsh to some. You may think, aren't some individuals in terrible situations such as extreme poverty, that in the end they have almost no choice? Yes, very true. And that's exactly what the model tries to discover. Would the same individual with a better job, education, or good life opportunities from the start not have turned away from crime? And what can we do to best achieve this? The cost-benefit approach really means that almost no one is predestined to commit crime or a born criminal. And that by finding the right policies to change incentives, most would choose a lawful life. <laughs>